Hello, my name is Carolyn Kassan and I am the academic director at the NYU Center for Global Affairs, also serve as the director of the new SPS Energy, Climate Justice and Sustainability Lab. And I am really, really delighted to be with all of you today. Thank you for joining for what promises to be a really fascinating conversation, looking at the very, very important United States, Canada energy relationship. We have very intentionally titled this event, Friends, Allies and Partners in Clean Energy and um, Climate Action. We recognize and at, at NYU and at the Center for Global Affairs, we've had a long history of partnering with the Canadian government on many, many energy events. Um, I've been fortunate to bring students both to Alberta and also to Quebec to you know, learn and to better understand how deep and how historical the relationship between the United States and Canada has been. And really delighted that, um, that in February, President Biden and Prime Minister Trudeau reset that relationship after a rather tumultuous roller coaster of a four years. But to get today's event um, started, really delighted to have um, two wonderful uh, speakers who will open, open today's session. Um, we will first hear from Fawar Nassim, who is the Consul General at Canadian Consulate General in New York. And I just want to say a very special thank you to Hawar because he, again, has really been a tremendous leader and has uh, done so much also for, relation, for the relationship between New York and Canada. Hawar? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for those kind words, Carolyn. Uh, it's lovely to see you again. And I, and, uh, I, I say that with a bit of chagrin because I, I, I really do look forward to, to getting back to in-person events. Uh, Bonjour et bienvenue tout le monde, um, and, and thank you to uh, all of your partners, Dr. Kassan at the Center for Global Affairs uh, at, at NYU for your work on today's event uh, and for your partnership and friendship over many years with all of us at the Consulate General. We really do value your, uh, your, your, your friendship. I'd also like to acknowledge the expert panelists and speakers we have today, uh, Marco Presutti from uh, Natural Resources Canada and Gary Sutherland uh, of uh, Itoro, Quebec, and uh, Michelle Mannery, from, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary. She's in Portland and she's kindly joined us today. Delighted that she could be with us today. Uh, I'd also, it's also great to be joined online by my friend and colleague, uh, Catherine Loubier, who is the Delegate General of Quebec uh, to New York. Now, uh, as, as uh, Dr. Kissan mentioned, the, uh, the consul, the, 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 today's event is U.S. and Canada, Friends, Allies and Partners in Clean Energy and Climate Action. Uh, what, an, what an apt title. Uh, it's, it's, it's so timely and so relevant to discussion, and, and I'm really looking forward to it. Now, I, I think I should start by, by answering the question, you know, for, for those of you who wonder, what does a, a consulate general do? Well, we, we do the full range of Canada and New York. That's passports and visas. We combat tariffs and protectionism. We promote the USMCA. We work with small Canadian tech companies. But, you know, a huge part of our relationship with the United States and, and certainly with New York State is, of course, centered around energy and climate. Uh, on our team, I have the good fortune of having the expertise of uh, Kavoy Pyron. If you, if you haven't met her, please do. She leads uh, our, our file here in New York, and she's the one who helped coordinate uh, today's event. Uh, so thank you to you, Kavoy. You know, I'm, I'm speaking to you today from our offices in Manhattan, uh, and I can share with those of you who are not in New York, that, uh, you know, the expression New York is back. Well, New York is back and the comeback is well underway. And there's a sense of vibrancy as it recovers from being the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic in the US and arguably in the world to uh, a thirst and an appetite to get back to some degree of normal. For my friends in Canada, I can only share with you the optimism that that brings and the, and the revitalization that that brings to one spirit. 
you know, um, the other thing I'm trying to work on and I'll resolve quickly are those pesky remaining issues. I'm going to get that border reopened quickly, but don't ask me about specifics because I'll be short on specifics right now. But, you know, it's an exciting time in the Canada-U.S. relationship. Dr. Kassan mentioned the new partnership that we have with the Biden administration. We've gotten off to the on the right foot on many fronts. And I think that it's been defined by a roadmap for a renewed Canada-US partnership. The president and the prime minister are meeting uh, over the next couple of days in England for the uh, the, the G7 meeting. And I, I, uh, we anticipate that there'll be progress, continued progress in that relationship. Because you know the commitment and the cooperation, the, 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 the nature of our relationship, we're each other's number one trading partners, each other's number one investments, each other's number one energy suppliers. And we always say that we're free, fair, honest trading partners and reliable partners in a whole range of, of areas. And so when both governments talk about building back better, I think that today's subject is exactly that. It's about our shared clean energy infrastructure. You know, as many of you already know, Canada and the US are, have the largest energy relationship. We are each other's number one supplier. We supply more oil and gas and hydraulic power and all ranges of power to the US than any other supplier. In fact, three times more than the number two supplier. You're gonna hear today about the importance of how we expand and grow on that, how we have modernized that infrastructure to effectively make that transition to clean uh, resources. Uh, you're going to hear today about Canadian hydropower, how it can help border states affordably reduce emissions in their power sectors, not only by directly providing clean electricity, but also through serving as a supportive, reliable backstop for increased development of intermittent U.S. renewable resources like wind and solar. We're certainly seeing this here in New York with the province of Quebec's hydroelectricity uh, and various innovative proje projects, policies, and programs. And, and this is going to bring us to a truly decarbonized future. You know, there are a multitude of projects that we're working on in, in, uh, across Canada and the U.S. I was just talking with a, a colleague uh, in Minnesota, a area I, uh, an area I know quite well. But we have two cross-border projects right here in my Consulate General's territory, uh, the Lake Erie Connector and the Champlain Hudson Power Express, the latter of which is poised to make a huge contribution to climate action in New York City and state. So uh, a timely, important discussion, and I'm really looking forward to being a part of it. I, I thank you all for joining us today, and I'm, I'm pleased to turn it over to our exceptionally qualified uh, moderator, uh, Carolyn Kassan. Thank you, Carolyn. Over to you. Laura, thank you so very much for those remarks. And now I'm going to pass it, pass it along to Michelle Monnery who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Energy Resilience in the Office of Electricity, the U.S. Department of Energy. Michelle, thank you so very much for joining us today. Thank you, and I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I always laugh about these titles. They're the longest title I've ever had in my life. <laughs> and so uh, basically, um, uh, I'm in the Department of Energy under uh, the Office of Electricity. Uh, my organization really focuses on transmission. Our focus, um, is really to look at transmission and figure out how in the world do we, uh, do we meet the demands of the nation. As you may know, President Biden has set a goal of 100% decarbonization by 2035. This could require a large amount of transmission to bring generation to load centers. It's a big goal. The Department of Energy, particularly my office, the Office of Electricity, recognizes the importance that increased transmission provides in terms of system reliability and resilience, very important. Um, one of the items President Biden and Prime Minister Trudeau agreed to under the Roadmap for Renewed US-Canada Partnership was to take a coordinated approach to accelerating progress towards sustainable, resilient, and clean energy infrastructure, including encouraging the development of cross-border clean electricity uh, transmission. The Department of Energy's Office of Electricity, or OE, because we like to acronym everything, 
uh, reviews applications for presidential permits for transmission facilities crossing the U.S. international border, as well as export authorizations for electricity exported to foreign countries over those facilities. OE stands ready to review applications for presidential permits and export authorizations that would further increase the trade of electricity as outlined in the recently announced roadmap. DOA, DOE may issue a presidential permit after finding the pro proposed project is consistent with public interest and after favorable recommendations from both the US Department of State and the Department of Defense. Recently, the department issued a presidential permit for the New England Clean Energy Connect project. If constructed, it would bring about 1200 megawatts of hydropower from Canada to Lewiston, Maine in order to respond to Massachusetts clean energy goals. The project would also benefit the state of Maine by creating jobs both during the construction phase and during operations, as well as bring about an additional 18 million annually to the state in tax revenue. OE recently issued an amended presidential permit for the Champlain uh, Hudson Power Express project that, that Coar just uh, 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 referenced. If selected in New York's recent clean energy RFP uh, request for proposals process, the project would bring about 1,250 megawatts of hydropower from Quebec into New York City. In recognizing the important partnership between our two countries, my office, in conjunction with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, expanded the regulatory and permitting information desktop, what we like to call RAPID, since it's a very long title, uh, the RAPID toolkit to include Canadian federal, provincial, and First Nations requirements for permitting transmission facilities between our two countries. Staff at Natural Resources Canada assisted us in the expansion. Uh, the RAPID Toolkit facilitates communication between project developers and permitting agency personnel among permitting agencies at all jurisdiction levels and among all project stakeholders, including the project, including the public. And so it really does bring everything together. My office, as well as the department, recognizes the longstanding mutually beneficial electricity relationship that our countries have enjoyed, and my office stands ready to help to continue it. Thank you. Michelle, thank you so very much. Um, Hoar and Michelle have given us a wonderful foundation to jump into today's panel. And very, very grateful to have four really outstanding panelists joining us today. We have Julie Pierce, who's Vice President of Strategy and Planning, Minnesota Power. Marco Prasuti, who is the Director General, Electricity Resources Branch of Natural Resources Canada. Gary Sutherland, Director, Strategic Affairs and Stakeholder Relations, Northeast Markets of Hydro-Quebec, and Rob Gramlich, who's the Executive Director, Americans for a Clean Energy Grid. So thank you for joining us. Julie, we're gonna jump right in and go to you first. So this time last year, the, um, the great Northern Transmission Line was energized involving Minnesota and North Dakota and the Canadian province of Manitoba. Um, very curious to get um, get your take on you know what what were the what motivated the project, um, and what has your experience been with it so far? And is it is this a project that is replicable across the U.S. Canadian border? Thank you, Carolyn, and great to be with you today. So um, yes, Minnesota Power and Manitoba, the province of Manitoba and Manitoba Hydro. Uh, set off on a major renewable initiative uh, that was created really as part of a greater need for a synergy between U.S. and Canadian resources here in the Midwest, largely wind and hydro. Our company, Minnesota Power, had an has an energy forward strategy for its decarbonization vision. We set milestones to be 50% renewable by 2021 and 80% carbon free by 2030 and our long range vision of, of course, carbon free. We embarked on this journey early uh, in the early 2000s, knowing the tremendous lift it was going to be to shift our system to meet these goals. And on the Manitoba side, they had additional hydroelectric capability that they were looking to get online to serve their long-term needs. So immediate synergy and the need for additional transmission came to light. So 10 years ago, uh, the new 224 mile uh, 500 kV line it was designed to connect the Midwest system with the hydroelectric system to the north. 
Um, and this connection does two things. It increases the reliability of power in the Midwest. It makes it more stable. It creates redundancy that's needed on days like today when it's very warm and the power system needs power. It also does uh, a lot to allow the hydro storage reservoirs to be optimized with the wind rich system here in the upper Midwest. And that helps us meet our renewable goals. So it's truly what I would call a win-win. And this project has just been a phenomenal experience. We, ha we have access to this reliable hydropower each day to serve our customers and optimize with our renewable wind resources. And you know, you asked about our experience and I, I can't say enough. Uh, interacting on a major infrastructure project like this was meaningful and impactful to our organization, our region, our community. And we used our deep values here uh, in culture to engage with our communities and stakeholders very early on in the project, right away. So the minute we started thinking about it, we started engaging and it was early often and we helped them understand our vision and the story of why this great Northern transmission line was needed. And then on the flip side, we listened. Uh, we listened carefully and we made meaningful adjustments to our plan, to our route, to our timing, even based on the feedback that we got at over 60 public meetings that we did. And we built longstanding relationships with our tribal councils in the area. This really set a foundation for success. Um, you know, the line was energized without much fanfare. I love our industry. We just flip a switch and we, you know, we bring major 100 year infrastructure into B. Um, it represented investment, long standing tax base uh, for our communities, and it will be a long standing visionary component of the energy sector here in the Midwest. Um, you know, it has already been put to use. We already used it heavily during the polar vortex this winter. We're using it today uh, when half of the North Dakota transmission is uh, down due to big storms. This line is creating reliable and uh, clean power that is coming down and it's a stabilizing force for our region. And it really brings um, sustainable energy together with us. Um, I do feel it's replicable. Carolyn, thank you for asking. Um, we have with Canada a long-standing partnership, as we already heard um, earlier in the session here, in the electric sector. Uh, we can produce efficient solutions for getting after our collective renewable energy goals together. But we need to work together to keep the reliable electric service and cleaner energy supplies flowing to our customers. So again, we started early. These are 10 year plus endeavors. So we need to be constantly looking for ways uh, to make everything more efficient. Everything from the communication to the storytelling, permitting and understanding the need for these projects now. So thank you for asking. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for that detailed response. I, I have to say, having you know read a lot about the project, it does seem like you read it and it seems in terms of your stakeholder process, everything that you were able to accomplish in terms of getting the, the buy-in throughout the entire process is, um, it's just strikes me as a very outstanding sort of model that, um, that can be used for to create the, this greater cooperation. So it's really, it's, it's very exciting. And the, this idea of the bi-directionality, right? In terms of your, your ex you're ex importing hydro from Canada, but then exporting um, wind power. So yeah. it's interesting. Yeah, that true win-win. And um, yeah, it was a very uh, successful project. We had we had uh, no negative uh, comments on the project and we it was just phenomenal. Excellent, that's wonderful. So I'm going to um, head over to, to Gary, Gary from Hydro-Quebec. Um, uh, you know, Quebec has had a very long-standing um, energy relationship with New England and with with New York. I think over over a century in terms of the relationship. Um, and these two markets are, you know, are looking to bring more clean energy on, especially where fossil fuels have dominated, and they're looking to transition to cleaner cleaner sources of energy. So, how can current and future projects involving Hydro Quebec contribute to this ongoing energy transition and how can it strengthen the regional grid? And if I could just maybe add on to that question and you know, thinking about the impact on you know, both the, the Northeast economy um, and also down to the consumer level. 
Those are really great questions, Carolyn. Um, th thanks for setting that up, and and you know, thanks both to Julie and to Michelle because you really kind of laid the foundations for what I'm going to talk about. Uh, this is a truly a long-standing relationship. So, Quebec has been selling energy into the New York market for over a hundred years now. So this isn't from yesterday. It's it's you know, it's a part of our infrastructure and it's a part of our long-standing commercial relationship. And so this is a good foundation that we can build on and expand and kind of move forward. We already supply today about 5% of New York State's electricity, but there's a lot of room to do more. Hydro-Quebec is, is North America's biggest producer of renewable energy. And we've been actually in the last 17, 18 years building that capacity out a great deal. Back in the, the beginning of the 2000s, um, the writing was starting to be on the wall. You know, we were talking about the Kyoto Protocol. We were talking about Reggie throughout the Northeast. And so we looked at our system, knowing that it does take us about 15 years to build a new hydropower station. We started to think to the future and to think about what the demand for clean energy was gonna be, not just here in Quebec, but outside of Quebec as well. So we did bring on about 5,000 megawatts of new capacity in that time. And that's really what's allowed us today to be able to sit down with partners like New York and New England and say, look, we've got energy that we can commit to you for the next 20, 25 years. So that's great from the generation side. And we do have an interconnected grid. But unfortunately, that interconnected grid is pretty much saturated. The last time that we actually built a line from Quebec into the Northeast markets in the US was over 30 years ago. So we're working on a pretty old infrastructure that when demand is high in Boston or New York City, we just don't have any room on the transmission lines to get anything else down. So that's where we come back to the Minnesota Manitoba example, because it is a great prototype of what we can do in the Northeast. And I've been looking at that project for years, thinking, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could replicate it into the US Northeast markets? And there's a lot of things that we can do with new lines. Michelle mentioned two that have just been permitted at the federal level in the US. So NECC, the New England Clean Energy Connect into, um, that goes into Maine to serve Massachusetts and Champlain Hudson Power Express that would actually bring us all the way down into New York City. Those are two really exciting initiatives that I think are gonna change the structure of the energy markets, uh, much in the same way that the line between Minnesota and Manitoba has changed structurally the way that you're looking at things today. And I think really the way that you're gonna be looking at them tomorrow because there are immediate needs. You know, we're looking at a lot of fossil fuel. And if we go come, come back to the example of New York, um, New York City is a particular, um, it's a particular situation. The state in general, you've got a lot of renewable clean resources in the North that's great, but you've got this zone of congestion on the transmission system that doesn't allow any of those Northern producers, be they within the state of New York or on the other side of the border to get into New York City where you're getting close to 90% fossil fuel generation. And that's a situation that we really have to flip over and find great solutions to because you have put in place these great goals to reduce your carbon content in a very, very short period of time. So what can we do? What can we do with a line like Champlain Hudson? Well, first of all, in the immediate um, time right after it's built, and this is a project that is fully permitted in the US, shovel ready. It's been looking for its business case basically. And we've had that with a recent RFP that was launched by NYSERDA in New York for tier, what they call tier four, which is clean energy that's delivered into New York City. And so of course, with that, we can start to flow energy directly into New York City to replace some of the fossil fuel generation, which is going to be great from a carbon point of view, from a climate change point of view, but also from a health point of view, because a lot of those fossil fuel plants are older. They are releasing a lot of particulate matter or NOx and SOx into the atmosphere, and all of that is affecting people's respiratory health which I think in the last year, everybody's kind of focused a little bit more on uh, because of, of what we've been living through. So that's great in, the, in kind of the immediate um, years after that. But I think this type of a, an asset has a lot of value in the longer term as well. New York is bringing, gonna be bringing on so much in terms of wind and solar resources in the coming years. And we've seen the figures and they're, they're absolutely mind boggling. And all of those resources are great, and that's what we need to be moving to. And that's gonna be the energy transition. 
but we're going to have to twin them or to to complement them with something else that can pick up the slack when the wind's not blowing or when the sun's not shining but also can kind of absorb that extra energy when really there's too much being produced with respect to demand. Exactly in the same way that Minnesota and Manitoba are working that complementarity between the hydro reservoirs in Manitoba and the, the variable resources that are running um, throughout MISO. So we see this as really being a great um, new type of infrastructure that's flexible and it can be used in a different way and kind of accompany and, and adapt to the changing situation that we're gonna be seeing in New York, but also New England, um, really the same type of thing. Our reservoir system here in Quebec is, is huge. It's got a storage capacity that's actually larger than all of New York State's electricity needs for an entire year. So there's room there. There's room to kind of get a regional, um, a regional system going where we can work off each other's strengths and really kind of bolster each other's weaknesses as well. And I think that's where we're moving to. And kind of coming back to the consumer, um, I have a new CEO that I've had for the last year or so. And um, Sophie has really brought a new vision to the, to the company. Um, one which is really focused on the customer. And many times um, she's come back to us and said, we always have to have the customer and the customer's best interests in mind. And I think that's where we get into some really interesting results when we look at the synergy that we can get going between different types of resources over a wider regional level, because we know decarbonization is gonna cost a lot. And all we can do to bring that cost down by really getting the right resources to be working together is beneficial at the end of the day for the rate payer. And I think that's what we're really, really focusing on um, when it comes down to our highest priority. That's great, thank you so much. Yeah, I had the pleasure and I think it was 2015 to actually travel up to James Bay. And it was, it is quite an extraordinary vision for the eyes, right? To see, to see, to see the hydro power, like very much the power. Um, that's that's there. It has been. I mean, it's an it's been an incredible story in terms of getting here, right? You've had to deal with a lot of New York politics, both at the city and at the state level. But it's and also you know civil society organizations. But congratulations for getting to this to this place where um, where it's going to happen. Um, and I again, I, you know, and I in Hawar in a, a a speech that I heard him um, maybe last year, two years ago. He called, you know, Quebec the, the battery of the northeast of the United States. So um, it's uh, we. I love the idea of the the interconnection and the um, and the, the bi-directional relationship. So thank you. I'm going to move over to um, to Rob. And Rob, I I really enjoyed reading your your most recent report. Uh, transmission, transmission ready to go. Um, I really encourage all of our audience to read it because it looks at, you know, 22 shovel ready transmission projects, um, two of which are cross-border uh, transmission lines. Um, so Rob, um, just in terms of, you know, there's so much talk right now, right, with regards to infrastructure um, here in the United States and, you know, these are ongoing infrastructure talks, um, also how we're going to uh, decarbonize and, and decarbonize in a much deeper way than, than where we're currently at. Um, and you cited you know, 22 uh, dig ready projects in the United States and two that could cross the United States and Canada. You know, how, do you, how did you choose these projects? And why do you think building interstate and cross-border transmission infrastructure is, is key to both the US and the Canadian economy, but also to you know, achieving our uh, very ambitious clean energy goals. Um, sure. Thank you, Carolyn. Thanks, everybody. Um, on your second question on sort of why is this cross-border transmission important? Why is transmission important at all? Um, so uh, I, I think it's helpful to just think about how First of all, our our best opportunity to reduce uh, emissions, I think, is in the power sector, and of course, this and then the second best is electrifying other sectors. So it all gets back to the the power grid, and then how do you how are we going to do that with known and affordable technologies? That means a lot of wind and solar in the near term, and power systems can operate with you know up to eighty or ninety percent wind and solar, um, but. Uh, 
there are certain things that have to happen to make that work. Um, you need some form of uh, firm source to, to be around for the other times when you don't have the wind and the solar. And you also need to move a lot of power across um, both space and time. And so across space means moving up around geographically. Julie described the, uh, the upper Midwest and how uh, the, the new line there is moving power around. Uh, and you think e even uh, aside from climate considerations, you think about just severe weather um, and the uh, February events in that in that region, you know, we were shipping 10 gigawatts from the west to the sorry from the east to the west. Even though a whole bunch of the transmission in that region was planned based on moving west to east, you know, upper Midwest into Chicago and points east. So that's just how we need to plan for our future grid and our future energy system. We need to be basically planning to move, you know, ship massive amounts of power around. Um, it's not totally a new idea. We built a, the one, the longest HVDC line we have in the U.S., the, the Pacific DC Intertie that President Kennedy got going and was energized 50 years ago um, to bring low-cost remote hydro down to Southern California and, you know, growing uh, load there. But on a day-to-day -day basis now, I guarantee you right now as we speak, it's shipping a ton of solar power up north uh, from California to the Northwest. And then at night, it's gonna ship the hydro and wind back down. So that's how just systems are gonna operate that, which means we need a lot of cross border, uh, cross state border, cross regional border, cross uh, interconnections, the Western and the Eastern interconnection in Texas, uh, all that kind of transmission. And then of course, across national borders. And the additional opportunity here with Canada and the U.S. is, um, you know, we don't really have a clean, firm source of power here in the U.S. We have natural gas and the existing gas fleet will, you know, be there providing a lot of that firming um, on-demand standby um, source um, in the near term. Although we saw even in Texas, we have questions about gas reliance. Um, uh, but, you know, hydro is a, a perfect, you know, complement to, to wind and solar. It's, it's on demand and it's standby. Uh, you know, in, in Europe, they've got, I think, 180 terawatt hours of uh, storage between, you know, Norway and Sweden. And that's kind of a little known fact about how do they do such high renewable energy penetrations while they're shipping it back and forth between the Nordic countries. Same thing, we, you know, in the west central and eastern parts of canada uh you get about that same range 200 uh terawatt hours it's a just a massive battery up there that it could be useful in in all regions of the u.s it's a hundred thousand times the the uh energy that we had uh in in lithium ion batteries on the grid at least as of the end of 18 i haven't updated it so but it's it's just you know, what is that five orders of magnitude or something? It's just, it's nowhere close. So that's what we, that's what we need to do. Um, and, you know, there are a number of, so that's a long-term objective for planners. And then in the short term, moving to your first question. Uh, yeah, there's a lot that's uh, being discussed here in the Washington uh, area and the Biden administration's American Jobs Plan. You, you heard from Michelle about their, their interest uh, in this. And we were pleased that the, the White House um, mentioned our report. It's on uh, cleanenergygrid.org where there's a White House fact sheet that links to our report about 22 projects that are ready to go. Collectively, they would increase, uh, if they all went forward, they would increase renewable energy uh, output in the United States by 50%. That's a lot. Um, and these projects are largely through at or near the, the finish line in terms of permitting uh, to answer your question of how are these selected. Um, you know, you can quibble about any individual one of them, but we, you know, we think um, these are all pretty, pretty far along. And you know, New England Power, Clean Power Link, Champlain Hudson, the Lake Erie con, uh, connector going from Ontario under Lake Erie into Pennsylvania. It's another one. There's a couple in New York addressing that upstate to downstate, sort of the the tale of two grids in in New York um, that would also, you know, get get closer to. Um, Canadian power. Um, so we need to do a lot of this in the US. My group um, 
uh, Americans for a Clean Energy Grid is working on that, but you know, very open to ideas about uh, across the border. And my friend Phil Dugay and uh, with Canada Grid is, I know, working on these issues in Canada, and we're talking a lot about how do we sort of work together. So look forward to the conversation here and working with with all of you on on uh, power sh sharing in the future. Excellent. Well, thank you, Rob. And I, I appreciate that you um, you raised the Norway. Um, a few years ago, I took students to Norway and Denmark, and that was a big theme that we heard a lot about, right, in terms of Norway being Europe's green battery. And I think much of what we see coming out of Europe in terms of their, their climate ambition plans, um, you know, very much Norway's a big part of that, right? It's not oftentimes the at the center of the story, but behind the scenes, Norway plays a very, very important role. So, um, yeah, well, um, and uh, you know, th that's not the only play. You look around the world, a lot of the high renewable penetration experiences are because of, you know, a lot of sinking up hydro and, uh, and, and uh, wind and solar. So, yeah, Chile as well. Um, and yeah, I just want to also point out with, uh, with Rob's report is that I think you, you noted that it represents about 10% of the transmission that we actually need, right? We need a lot more transmission to, you know, achieve our net zero targets. Um, but the report is a great, a great start in terms of looking at, you know, 22 projects that are ready to go. Um, so we're getting some great questions coming in from the audience. We're going to get to those, but first I have a question for, um, for Marco. And Marco, thanks for your patience. Um, so uh, President Biden and Prime Minister Trudeau have you know, decided to renew and update the memorandum of understanding on the reliability and security of North American infrastructure between the United States Department of um, Energy and the Department of Natural Resources Canada, where you are. So what are some of the immediate ways um, the Canada and the United States can enhance cooperation on sustainable clean energy innovation? And you know, specifically, what are some of the technologies that you see maturing and being leveraged to reach you know, the clean power and climate targets that, that both countries um, have set. Great, thanks, Carolyn. I hope everyone can hear me well. Uh, just for first, thanks, Carolyn. Th thanks others for just for the introductions and, and for bringing us together here. It, it's already been a real fascinating discussion um, for me. I'm learning a ton. I just wanted to start by acknowledging that I'm joining today from my home in Ottawa, which is the traditional territories of the uh, Algonquin and Anishinaabeg people. And in Canada, we have a, a practice of acknowledging traditional territories as a way of not only recognizing the past, but also kind of thinking about how we can work and partner with Indigenous communities uh, going forward. And certainly with the discussion that we're having right now about, you know, the need for transmission infrastructure and all types of important infrastructure for um, decarbonizing uh, North America. I think this is certainly one of those areas where we're all, I know, thinking about and working hard to figure out how we can partner with uh, local communities and with uh, and with indigenous peoples. Um, I, I think, you know, um, so much of what I wanted to say has already been covered by many of the other panelists. And, and I think Kaur did such a great job of eloquently setting the stage for the Canada-US uh, re relationship. Um, uh, but but maybe perhaps just sort of at, at the heart, heart of your question, just the, the sort of Trudeau-Biden relationship. I, I, I think, you know, if I can talk a bit about um, you know, electricity. I, I think, you know, we're starting from a real position of strength. Right? There, there, there's the obvious stuff that kind of binds our two countries together, geographic proximity. We already have this sort of real deep integration between our economies. And, and you know, as others have already said, there is this shared infrastructure that already exists. We've got 30 plus transmission lines that already kind of flow power across the border. And, and this real, you know, long history of of collaboration, but uh, you know, I, I just want to kind of reiterate what many of you have already said. I think we're also at this moment in time right now where, where you have this real alignment of, of values, alignment of values at a political level, a real de deep sense of the need to work uh, not only just in our own countries, but with you know the, the planet just to address climate change and to decarbonize our our economies and, and our electricity systems. So, so from where I'm sitting in, in the government of Canada, and you know, I've been in my role for 20 plus years, I, I think, you know, I, I really do see real opportunity that lies ahead. And, you know, it, it's not always the case, as others have said, that we have this sort of real alignment of values, but we, we are at that, uh, that moment of time. And I think that the roadmap 
um, that, that that's been referenced as a real you know excellent opportunity to start to deepen some of those connections. You know, you, you asked about alignment of targets. I, I think I think we're, we're we're already there. I think you know both countries have really set in the electricity space ambitious targets. In Canada, we're aiming to achieve 90% non-emitting generation by 2030. I think in the U.S., it's even more ambitious. It's 100 by 2030. I think these are tough goals, but certainly from the perspective of Canada, achievable. Um, per, perhaps I think you know you know in terms of the areas of collaboration to your question, you know, first and foremost, and maybe I'm going to sort of echo some of the sentiments that Gary and others have, have made, like, you know, I, I think in, in Canada, um, we're really starting from a position of strength. We have one of the cleanest grids in the planet, 28, 82% uh, of our power is already being generated from non-emitting sources. Our sector has already um, reduced its emissions by about 40% in the last 10, 15 years. Um, as Gary said, you know, we are one of the largest uh, water power producers um, in the world and, 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 and we're really, you know, like the US, we're really working hard to try to squeeze out the rest of those emissions from our sector. We put in place regulations at the federal level to retire um, all of our coal facilities by 2030. So that's, you know, beyond targets, actual uh, legally binding regulations. And at the same time, you know, we, some, of, some of the folks have already talked about sort of, it's not just about decarbonization, but it's also about reliability and affordability. We're, you know, we're, we're pretty fortunate in that, like just even in the OECD, Canada has its second lowest um, household rates. We have, we have some very experienced operators who can generate electrons at very low operating costs. So I, I think it's a, it's a real advantage. Um, it's, it's, I mean, it, you know, I, I'm speaking as if kind of it's, it's, you know, it's all perfect and rosy. Of course, that's not the case. Like we have, we have some, you know, big challenges um, around decarbonization, reliability, affordability. I think, you know, any of the economists in the room would tell you that like, you know, those last, that last 18% is the toughest emissions to, to get out of your system. It's, it's the stuff that um, will probably kind of push hardest on affordability. So, so um, we certainly have challenges as well, but but I think you know one of the areas that you know in terms of like where are the areas for collaboration certainly at the top of my list just to echo the sentiments that, that others have made is we're we're working in in the federal government to try to take some of the that that sort of clean power advantage that we have uh, and and connect power to places in the country that that need it and and we have some regional dialogues underway we have a dialogue in in Atlantic that that Gary knows very well and. We've got a dialogue in the prairies and also on the west coast, really trying to figure out how we foster those transmission connections so that you know places that have have that surplus power can um, support the efforts of jurisdictions that that need it. And I think you know that that's an obvious, as others have said. Like I think that extends um, be, to to Canada, U.S. I, I think the connections, the reality of sort of the way our markets work and our and our low, our supplies and our loads that we have we have you know stronger connections between. In north south connections than, than we do even east west in, in some parts of, of the country. But I do think, you know, that that like first and foremost, that's that's certainly an area where I could see already there's work to be done, that that, that work is happening and, and there's there's uh, there's certainly more work to be done. There's no like you know, I, I jotted a list and there's no shortage of, of areas, I think. I think there's strong alignment and work happening on both sides of the border where we can collaborate. Um, you know, I'm thinking about renewable integration. We've just, you know, at the federal level launched a new program to really kind of push wind, solar and, and new renewables into our system. And I think there's, there's work we can do collaboratively on that. Um, there's a critical minerals action plan that our governments have already signed together. Um, as we look down, you know, the value chain of some of the technologies that are going to be needed uh, to decarbonize and you look at sort of fuel switching and even batteries. Um, we, I think it's important that both countries work together to, to have that plan, that action plan, so that we can see some of these supply chains being developed here in, in North America. Um, EVs, grid modernization, energy efficiency, um, hydrogen, nuclear. I, I think, I think there, there's lots of areas where there is already sort of deep, deep collaboration already happening and, and more, more that we could do. Um, the, the last bit I'll say as well, too, is, you know, um, just on, on reliability and affordability, um, security, um, cybersecurity, I think, is a big one. I, you know, we, we started to do quite a bit of work uh, between our two countries. We're all aware of the, the colonial incident, of course, that, that recently happened. But that's, that's another kind of area where 
where I think we, we can collaborate. And maybe I'll just end on, on your question of technology. What are the technologies? Um, I, I think, you know, like we're, we're working super hard and, and I know you are as well too in the US um, to, to develop the sort of next, uh, the next enabling technologies that we're gonna need to decarbonize. We're, you know, we have technology roadmaps and, and funds that are supporting uh, businesses to develop new tech. We're, we're doing things in the hydrogen space, the SMR space, the grid mod space. Um, but, but, but I would also say in, in, in electricity, when we think about it um, in Canada, like it's also a zone where a lot of the solutions, a lot of the technologies already exist. The technologies that we need to kind of get to where we want to get to with our targets, like, you know, transmission, like tried tested tech transmission technologies that, that I think are going to be super important. So we don't have to look too far ahead to sort of future technology development. There are some solutions right ahead of us that we can uh, collaborate on. Thank you so much for that. That actually is a great segue into a question that we received from the audience. Um, and Marco, maybe you can take it. Um, Rob, it also may be a good question for you or for Julie. Um, how critical is the advancement of grid enabling technologies like HVDC transmission and energy storage to the growth of cross-border clean energy? Can energy actually become more, bi more bi-directional without these technologies? So who would like to jump in and take that one? I can do you start. Wrong. All right. Well, uh, certainly there are a number of advanced transmission technologies that can help a great deal with what I described before as a key objective, which is uh, to be able to move more power around. Um, and so there are advanced uh, conductors, different, you know, just different types of cable that can um, that can deliver a lot more power. You can convert some uh, AC lines to DC and double or um, quintuple the capacity sometimes, the delivery capacity, superconductors are being developed. Uh, so there's a lot of that type of thing. There's also what we call grid enhancing technologies. Well, what FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has defined as grid enhancing technologies, which are more uh, increasing delivery over the existing lines. And so there's a study that our, uh, I, one of my hats is on head of the Watt Coalition. So on watt-transmission.org, there's a study there with the Brattle Group that showed a, a, a doubling of the renewable projects that be, could be connected in the SPP region by deploying those grid enhancing technologies um, like dynamic line ratings and those sorts of things. So those are extremely important. And, and look, some of these lines we've mentioned, you know, Julie described the stakeholder work that really needs to be done. Some of these lines will require new rights of way. Right, a lot can go over existing rights of way and a lot of upgrades can happen, but sometimes we'll need new rights of way. People care a lot about how land is used. It's gonna be really hard every single time it's done. So what we really need to do is commit, I think as an industry to make maximum use of the existing network first and do that as much as we can, uh, recognizing that that's not gonna do it by itself. I mean, maybe I could just add, you know, agree 100% with what Rob said. I, I think on transmission infrastructure, uh, regional integration, like we, we've been at the federal level with provinces and, and utilities doing a lot of work around sort of trying to identify, you know, what are the, the, the transmission projects that could deliver um, the biggest megaton reductions. And, um, you know, as we've done modeling work and looked at sort of different scenarios, one of the consistent things that, that we see is that like a, a transmission connection, particularly when you have a neighbor like Hydro Quebec next door is often the kind of most cost effective way to go than building new generation. Like modeling after modeling, we, we've seen that, that become the result. So we certainly see um, transmission as a key part of how we're trying to decarbonize in Canada. Um, and, and, you know, probably one of the, more cost-effective solutions in a lot of different scenarios, not always, but in a lot of different scenarios. So that's certainly a priority for us. And you know, what, what I'll say, you know, just to echo what Rob had to say on, 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 on grid, grid modernization. I mean, we, we've, we've spent um, a lot of time and we've got sort of programs and initiatives underway that are working with utilities and companies to try to, you know, kind of introduce smart grid technologies. It's, it's not, uh, 
it's not the sexy stuff. It's hard to turn it into a ministerial announcement. It's, it's circuits, it's sensors, it's hard to describe, but it's certainly from the perspective of, of utilities and, and operators, it's really important stuff that we think like as we start to really try to, as we're seeing across the continent, integrate more variable renewables into the grid, it's really important that that technology sort of also moves along. Hey, uh, Carolyn, can I just add one uh, other thought? Uh, I just got this. I was getting a little distracted. Uh, a, a CNN producer told me to tune in this afternoon at 4.30 p.m. I don't know if everybody gets the same, but there's going to be a story about transmission, and it is a, actually a new technology. It's a, a voltage source converter uh, transmission line, the Sioux Green line from Iowa into Illinois, and it's going to be a little spot. It's one of those 22 projects in our report and they went out to Iowa and interviewed farmers and, and whatnot. So anyway, tune in and check that out. Thank you. That's great. I'm gonna definitely tune in. I wanna, I wanna, I wanna see that. And and thank you both Marco and Rob for for answering that question. So we're gonna move um, maybe this is a question for Julie and for Gary with regards to um, your experiences with the great great northern transmission line and and thinking about the Champlain Hudson line in terms of who funds these types of projects, right? Is it the federal government is it the pri private private sector companies, um, and this is a question from a member of our audience. I can start. Thank you, Carolyn. So for the Great Northern Transmission Line, it was uh, funded by the utilities that were building it, and so I think a lot of times, probably a pretty large majority of transmission gets built by uh, the entities that are going to be using the lines or where the lines are located is a pretty predominant force uh, for that. However, the structures in the United States, at least, uh, surely are in the markets, are starting to encourage more uh, development activity from other entities too. So entities that just want to privately invest or uh, provide uh, line options as well. So I, I think it's a little bit of everything, uh, but in the historically it's been predominantly utilities that are responsible for keeping the grid reliable and, and, and getting these lines in the air, but that's expanding very rapidly. Great. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a really great question if I can jump in, um, Carolyn, because there is, for, for, for lines like this that are built for a public policy initiative, i.e. moving a lot of clean energy around from point A to point B to respond to, to public policy imperatives like reducing carbon, it's a different type of a structure than what you would find for reliability lines. So if you have a reliability problem somewhere um, in a state and you need to build new transmission to keep the lights on for people, that's going to be done and it's going to be rolled into the tariff base. Uh, what we've been seeing, and, and we've been working on some of these projects for a really long time, Champlain Hudson, it, it's over 10 years now that we've been working with a really great developer um, on the US side, transmission developers. And originally we were thinking about doing that as a merchant line. So that would have been taken over by the utilities, by the two parties and, and really done on a merchant uh, basis. But of course, 10 years ago, prices in the market were a completely different thing than they are today. And we've seen the arrival of shale gas. Um, progressively, we're gonna be seeing prices probably not going up, but continuing at the same level or maybe even going down with influxes of, of intermittent uh, technologies. So it, it's a real conundrum. And the way that we've kind of tried to solve it is realizing that there is a discrepancy between what the rate payer and, and the state is able to pay for clean energy plus the transmission that's necessary to get it there and really what we can offer on the market and, and that there does have to be something that comes in to recognize that gap and, and to fill it. And that has taken a couple of different um, forms. In the case of New York, um, now it's part of the tier four, so the, the, the clean energy standard. And there will be a renewable energy credit that is given for the energy that's coming into, into the New York market in New York City. So that is really, that's part of the financial makeup now. And that is a recognition too, that this is a different type of energy that it should be considered a little bit differently from others that are not giving the same benefits on the, on the carbon front. Um, but it's a great question. And it's something I think that we're gonna need to deal with uh, more and more as we move forward. Once again, to find the right solutions, but that don't place undue burden on the rate payer at the end of the day or the taxpayer, depending on which way uh, that's financed. Uh, because it is gonna cost a whole lot, this energy transition. And we really, you know, especially coming out of COVID, we don't wanna put any extra burden on people um, from the pocketbook point of view. Okay, well, thank you. All right, so we have a, another question from a very dear friend of the CGA. 
um, in addition to renewed bilateral and subnational coordination, can any of the panel comment on how or if Canada and the United States are working together with a broader new net zero producers group launched in April? Anyone on that one? I don't have the answer, so I have to. I feel like it might be a question that I should be able to answer, but I don't have the answer, so I can follow up on that one. We can get, Rachel, we're gonna get back to you on that one, but thank you for the, uh, for the question. Um, okay, so we have a, another one coming up. Um, so what are going to be the biggest challenges for this relationship while the Biden administration is in the White House? <laughs> it, it, maybe I can kind of hazard a guess to begin with. Uh, I, I think we're always thinking and, and coming out of COVID, we're very, very focused on things like job creation, getting the economy relaunched. Um, and, and our kind of first reflex is always to kind of try and look inward. You're in New York, Carolyn, you want to get jobs out there for people in New York. I'm up in Montreal. We're kind of minded a little bit that way locally. And I think we have to make a conscious effort to think on a much more regional basis. Um, I, I look at the Champlain Hudson Power Express project, it's going to put people to work during its construction phase. Um, but of course, you know, the energy is going to be coming from Canada. Now, what is the effect at the end of the day for all that? Well, you do put people to work for a, a certain amount of time in New York, but you're also getting a firm source of energy that is going to be at a good price and, and that is going to keep prices stable. And I think it's going to be a, a cheaper um, solution than some other solutions to decarbonizing the New York market. So you're having an effect on the wholesale price of energy, which ultimately is going to have an effect on your consumer at the end of the day. And if you can keep consumer prices lower, well, you're really kind of favoring your economy at the same time. But, but it's going to be, I think, in the juggling of all of those kinds of aspects and, and realizing that we're faced with a, a global problem, climate change, and that we can't keep going with very, very local or national solutions, we have to look wider and, and look at some of those, those cooperation and collaboration initiatives that we can get going so that we can keep prices down at the end of the day, because it would be possible to, to fuel New York State and in New York City with renewables that are actually in state, but how much would it actually cost to build out all of those resources? It's going much beyond what the initial goals are for build out of, of wind and solar in New York. We need to get those technologies that are low carbon working together properly, and some of them just geographically are coming from other places like hydro from Canada. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. There is there was a follow up question to the to the um, about the the role of other governments, the role of other countries, right? Is is China, for example, does China play have any influence on the direction that the United States and Canada are taking? Um, I know that you know China is looking to build out a a lot of ultra high voltage transmission lines. Is does that is that having any kind of influence in terms of what China is doing, in terms of what the United States and Canada are doing? Rob? And I, I can't comment on what the US government and Canadian government are doing, but I, I, I can't say that there is a, um, uh, you know, two reasons why that China um, sort of macro grid development, you know, affects uh, what we do here, you know, number one, it shows, um, you know, sort of the technological pathway that they're beating us to. Um, they've got a lot of the same dynamics every country, just about every country has, which is remote renewables and, you know, load centers they need to get the renewables to. Um, and they've, you know, sort of busted through the, the ceilings on the capacity of these transmission lines. I mean, 1000 kV lines and, you know, it's really impressive. Um, but there's a, you know, there's a competitiveness aspect of that because, again, this dynamic is an issue in just about every country and certainly every continent. And, you know, so who wants to be the global world leader in those technologies as they get deployed all over the world? Do we, you know, do, do we, U.S. and Canada want to sort of cede it to China or do we want to have... Um, you know, companies based here uh, doing that. You know, we used to be the leaders in that technology. We lost it. Uh, we can get it back if we want. 
Okay, thank you for that. I cannot believe the hour flew by, so we're at the, the tail end. Um, I do also want to announce that, um, that this conversation will in some ways continue. Um, it's June 15th, the Canadian Embassy with the Canadian Electricity Association and the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions. They are hosting C2ES, the latest report, Clean Connection which examines the Canada-US cross-border electricity relationship. So it will be a, a roundtable discussion um, and um, you can, uh, the, a link to the event was just sent out. So uh, those of you again that are keen to continue learning about these important issues, do join that event on the 15th. It is Thursday afternoon, it is June. So I think we're almost moving into celebratory mode in terms of the weekend. We also, I'm gonna do a sh quick shout out to Gary because I hear that it's your birthday. So happy birthday, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Carolyn. <laughs> um, I was told it was okay to wish you a happy birthday. <laughs> um, but I really wanna extend my sincerest thanks to the four of you for joining us today. It was really, this was, I had like, I had a whole bunch of other questions, uh, but I knew that there probably was um, uh, not going to be enough time, but really grateful for everything that you brought to, uh, to the discussion and uh, what you've been able to share with our audience today. Many thanks again to Michelle Monnery and to Hawar Nassim for, um, for opening this event and to everyone in our audience. Uh, appreciate you taking the time. These are really, in my opinion, and I think everyone here, the, these are critical issues. This is, if we want to address climate change, this is what, you know, these are the types of projects we need to be uh, working on. We need to be working together with our Northern neighbor, Canada. Um, and um, everyone, please do take care and uh, hope to see you again, um, probably sometime in the fall when the CGA restarts their uh, public events. So everyone take good care and thank you again to our panelists.